Hey everyone, how's it going? I'm in from Bitopia University here. This is the final episode of season one. And on today's episode, I'm going to be showing you how to safely send and receive transactions and how to interact with decentralized applications via MetaMask. Uh, you can find us via our website, which is bitopia.org. You can pre-enroll as a student there and you can subscribe to our newsletter. At the bottom of the website, you'll find our various social media channels uh, that you can use to connect with us and reach out. If you want to take part in a more uh, regular manner and see what we're discussing in our campus, you can do so via campus.bitopia.org or if you have Telegram, which is an open source alternative to WhatsApp, uh, you can go to our Telegram channel via bitopia, uh, bitopia underscore you. So don't worry, all of these links will be posted at the bottom of the video. So if you're watching it, you can continue watching it without having to uh, worry about the links or anything like that. For the purpose of this uh, video, I will be demonstrating a wallet called Exodus. Exodus has been around for quite a long time. It is a open source wallet. That's quite important because it represents the uh, space where Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and all of these exist. It's important because it means that someone with the knowledge of, let's say, a programmer can check the code to make sure it's secure, there's no backdoors. And uh, the wallet supports almost all platforms. So whether you have a desktop, whether you have a mobile, whether it's Apple, Linux, Windows, Android, uh, they're good like that and they're able to support all those platforms. I will be using the desktop one on a Linux uh, laptop or operating system rather, to demonstrate some things that you should look out for and some things that are important. And uh, let's begin. Once you have the wallet, you will be able to select which cryptocurrencies uh, you want to have displayed on the interface. So that's really dependent on what you like. Andreas Antonopoulos uh, did say that cryptocurrencies are subjective. You decide what you like and uh, go from there. For this uh, demonstration, one of the things that I find limiting about the wallet, uh, before we begin the greater part of the demonstration, when you have a wallet, you should be able to generate an address as many times as you like. An address is similar to that of your bank account uh, number. Let's say someone wants to send you money, that's what you give them, uh, depending on where you are. So like your IBAN, if you're in Europe, uh, in Australia, will be your BSBN account number things like that. Though with a bank, you don't get to generate a new one. You allocated that one address uh, or bank account number or IBAN, and that's kind of what you give out to every single person that wants to send you money, whether it's your employee or a friend that uh, owes you a bit of money. In terms of cryptocurrencies and decentralized cryptocurrencies, you actually can generate as many addresses as you want with a good wallet. And uh, sometimes they don't let you do this because a lot of times I get the question, well, if I generate an address and I give it to someone and I generate a new one, will the old one still work? And perhaps due to that, uh, some wallets may limit that ability or give you one until it's been used and then generate a new one after, you know, that transactions come through on that address. So I can understand why some wallets would limit that, though I would like the ability to be able to generate as many as I like on the go. Uh, some wallets will have a feature which, you know, you just press generate a new one and you can do that as many times as you like. Uh, it's good to keep in mind that you should only use one address uh, for one transaction. Um, you can kind of work it out. So if three people want to send you a transaction, you can give them three different addresses. That way you're ensuring that, you know, their transactions are not being tied into the same address. Uh, it's easier to monitor. So you can monitor one address and make sure, okay, I can see that transaction came through from person A, person B came through that address, person C came through that address. Now, if you're an organization or if you're, you're a company, this can be expanded and used in even a greater detail. And uh, one of the most important parts of decentralization and being your own bank and you know, all of these 
empowerments that come with it is personal responsibility. So once we are our own bank, we need to have certain protocols in place to make sure the money that we are receiving and the money that we are sending is secure. And we do our best to make sure that the people that we are also dealing with are kept secure. Uh, for that reason, I find Exodus a bit limiting. Uh, you know, I don't have the ability to generate addresses on the fly. And you may experience this with other wallets as well. Really good wallets that are perhaps some may argue for more advanced users, um, though that may not be the case. It's simply just educating people on how to use them, uh, allow you to generate these as many, as many times as you like. So you can kind of get an understanding as to uh, why I said there's certain parts of it that I find limiting. The overall Exodus is great, uh, great interface, very easy to use and uh, quite popular. For the purpose of this demonstration, I will be using Ethereum uh, just because it's quicker to use. Uh, transactions go through much quicker than Bitcoin. They're just designed differently. And uh, once you have this wallet, you may have a pop-up come up and say, would you like to back up your wallet? Uh, the backing up process simply means writing down your private key. Now, for this wallet, it allows you to enter it without writing it down. Some other wallets like Coinami and uh, let's say Samurai Wallet, you need to write it down uh, before you enter the wallet. So again, it depends on how they have approached security. In one way, you could argue that you should have it written down before you enter the wallet because it's a bit irresponsible to give you access to the wallet. Some people may be lazy and they may never end up doing it and they could lose their money because those private keys give you ownership. Um, that's why it's also important that if you have a phone or even a laptop, never take a screenshot. Uh, everyone's very used to taking screenshots. It's not a good idea because it could get backed up to a cloud. Uh, your device could be compromised. Someone could have access to it. So when you're writing your private key, get a piece of paper, write it down, keep it somewhere safe. Uh, or keep it in a, let's say, text document and save it in a encrypted or password protected zip file uh, or put it on a USB stick. There are a lot of different things that you can do to keep that secure. Again, you're being your own bank, so you need to think differently. Uh, there's no organization to call up and be like, I've lost my wallet, what do I do? Uh, you just, no one will be able to help you. Uh, for that reason, these are the things that we go over our course to teach you the importance of it, you know, various ways on how you can keep your assets secure and uh, your private key is secure. So now we have the wallet. Uh, we already have $2 in there to demonstrate some things for this video. Uh, generally speaking, obviously it will be empty and someone can send you a small transaction just for you to play around with and learn how to use the wallet. Uh, pretty straightforward, you have a send and receive button receive obviously to receive a transaction from someone uh, you would give them that address if they have a phone they can scan that QR code and uh, the good thing with the QR code is that it reduces the possibility of a mistake so if you give someone that address you can copy and paste it and always make sure that you confirm the first three middle three and the last three whether it's numbers or letters uh, there have been spywares in the past where they changed that address and it could go to somewhere else. So make sure you do that. Limit your transactions as well. So if you're receiving $1,000, for example, you can break it down to smaller parts. Uh, you can request that a dollar be sent to you before the full final transaction. That's another way of doing it. And uh, it ensures it's respectful both ways because obviously someone's sending you money and uh, you don't want them to be sending it to the wrong address or it goes somewhere because you can't reverse it. That's the whole point of uh, uh, digital cryptocurrencies or decentralized cryptocurrencies. They can't be censored. So once it's sent, uh, you know, it's, it's done. So out of respect to them and yourself, it's good to ensure that, you know, you start with maybe a dollar. Okay, I received it. You can confirm the address. Please send the rest of the transaction. And uh, you go about it that way. So the address can be sent via the copy button or the QR code can be scanned by someone's phone. And uh, as long as you confirm it, send a little bit of a transaction to test it, 
to make sure it's the correct address and account, you should be okay. To send a transaction, it would be the reverse of that. So you can either scan a QR code or you can put the address there and uh, you can obviously play around with sending it in the cryptocurrency or shifting it to a value that you're more used to, so such as US dollar, it might be easier for someone to do that and then be given the uh, amount in a decentralized cryptocurrency amount. Though the amount that's displayed in, let's say in this case, Litecoin, uh, you may want to confirm with some online websites as to what the price of it is, because this wallet may be getting the price from a particular place, and uh, it's always respectful again to confirm with the other person. Uh, let's say they are sending you a thousand dollars. You say, "Hey, to me, uh, that means twenty-three point five Litecoins. Are you okay with that?" And then they can also confirm based on whatever value that they are getting or whatever rate that they are getting, uh, whether that aligns with their end. So these are some small tips to give you uh, to make sure you, know, you keep everything nice and peaceful. Now, this is your general wallet, send and receive. There's not much else to it really. And uh, as long as you have your private key backed up, you can always recover this wallet. Uh, you can also use your private key to recover your account on a different wallet. So the private key is not dependent on the wallet in most cases. Uh, so you can take that private key and restore your account on a completely different wallet. So that's, that's a great thing to know as well. So you're not locked into this particular wallet. Um, that private key belongs to the network. So it belongs, if, you, if it's for Bitcoin, for example, it belongs to the Bitcoin network rather than the wallet. And uh, that's something else to keep in mind. So some tips there to make sure you can cruise through it. Now, we want to make a transaction. So let's go through that. To make a transaction, uh, I will need another wallet. For that purpose, I will begin with MetaMask. MetaMask is a wallet that allows you to interact with decentralized applications. Decentralized applications, much like Decentralized Autonomous University, uh, which Bitopia created, is a way of uh, functioning without a centralized entity. So decentralized applications, uh, similar to decentralized cryptocurrencies, are applications that are jurisdictionless. So in previous videos, I had shown you uh, an example of decentralized applications and uh, how to create decentralized organizations and uh, one of those platforms would, was Aragon. So Aragon is a platform that lets you create decentralized organizations rather than applications. So if you have an existing, let's say, charity organization, a company, a business, whatever it may be, you can recreate that in a decentralized way uh, using Aragon. And uh, to be able to do that, what we will see is to connect to your account, you're given various uh, options. So in our case, we need MetaMask to interact with it. There are other platforms as well, though MetaMask is the most widely used. So if you have Chrome browser, depending on what browser you have, it supports you know, a great deal of browsers, you can go to metamask.io and learn more about you know, what they're doing. Great work on their behalf. Uh, there you can see it supports Chrome, Firefox and Brave. We're using Brave, so we're going to go on to that. And it's similar to the you know, Chrome setup. We added pretty straightforward, pretty quick. And now we begin. This is where the private key that I mentioned before uh, comes into play. So if you had had MetaMask before, you can import your words and get access to your MetaMask account again. So let's say you bought a new laptop and you want to uh, download MetaMask again, you can do so that way. And uh, the, the words that you had written down, you would enter there. Though we're going to start with a new one. Uh, it gives you some tips on how it works. 
So we're going to go ahead and put some password. So you can see this backup phrase gives you ownership of the account. So we can see these 12 words here. If anyone in the world had access to these 12 words, they could take over your account. That's why it's very important that you, know, you don't take a screenshot or things like that I mentioned before. And they've given you a tip here as well uh, on top of those other things that I mentioned before. So pretty straightforward. That's our phrase. And then once you've done that, it will ask you to confirm those phrases. And we can go ahead and do that. It wants to make sure that you have written them down correctly before it gives you access to the account. So Exodus allows you to come in. Uh, this one, as mentioned, some wallets don't let you do that. They wanna make sure that you have your backup uh, written down and uh, you've done it correctly. So we'll go ahead and enter these words. Nice. So it says, you know, that you're, 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 the words that you've written down are correct. It matches what had been given to you previously. And that's it. Now we have access to MetaMask. MetaMask now uh, functions on Ethereum. So most decentralized applications uh, use Ethereum as a framework or, or decentralized organizations. So now that we have MetaMask, it's an extension of Brave or whatever browser you're using. We can return to Aragon and uh, refresh the page. And now we have a pop-up saying, uh, would you like to use Brave Crypto Wallet or MetaMask? So we're going to use MetaMask. Now, if we go connect, we have the option for MetaMask. And this is what I meant with MetaMask allows you to interact with decentralized applications or organizations and if you want to participate within decentralized uh, university of bitopia uh, it's a similar process so it will request from your wallet uh, would you like to connect your wallet to uh, aragon and you go ahead and say yes and now we are connected to it in the same way that your private key gives you ownership of your wallet in the case of exodus uh, in this case it gives you ownership of Again, it's a Ethereum address, though that Ethereum address could be your, let's say, user for that particular organization. So now it's a way of logging in. So in the same way that you would log into an email address with an email and password, in this case, we are logging in using our uh, MetaMask Ethereum address. So it's important to keep it safe because let's say an organization or an app uh, that you're using uh, let's say you have accumulated, it's a game or it's an app that you have done work with. You want to make sure you don't lose that reputation or the work that you've done because it's linked to that particular address in the same way that your email address and password to log in uh, would be linked to you know, the work that you've done for that particular platform or app. So now that we're in, uh, we can do various things. We can create an organization, though there needs to be money in there for you to be able to do so. And uh, we can open an organization and participate within it. We can vote, we can do other things. But for the time being, I want to make a transaction. I want to send some money from Exodus to my MetaMask account so that I may be able to interact with some of these applications that require you to pay for uh, submitting a vote or submitting a proposal. To receive the transaction, we go deposit and uh, directly deposit ether, so sure. And that is our address. Uh, in this case, because it's MetaMask interacting with decentralized apps, it's also our username. So we can either grab it from there or we can also come here and 
copy to clipboard. Now that we have it, we can come back to Exodus. We can go to send. We can put it here. Let's check the address to make sure that is correct. First three. So we'll put it up here so we can see it. First three, zero x zero, zero x zero. Let's pick these three, F33, F33, and it ends in 068068. Cool. And uh, what we're going to do is send one to make sure that it's the correct address. And due to the transaction fee, uh, you obviously have to pay that to the network. Uh, so you, in this case, we paid about 19 cents in uh, transaction fees, which is quite substantial. Though it depends on how busy the network is. So if I did this very early in the morning or I did it on a different day, it could differentiate uh, in terms of the price. And now we see the transaction has come through. So we have $1 in our uh, wallet and the transaction fee has gone to the network for the people who process this uh, transaction. Done. And that's how simple it is. So this money could have gone to anyone in the world and no one would be able to stop it. And uh, now our MetaMask account has funds in it for us to interact with various decentralized applications. In the same way, I can send you know, the, the, the money back to Exodus And we can click max to just empty out the account and see the transaction fees are listed here. Though in Exodus, uh, you can go into the settings and alter these things though again, to keep people, uh, you know, stop pe prevent people from uh, getting confused. Some wallets just keep it streamlined and keep it on average. So they've left it on average in Exodus and they don't really bring it up for you. Though again, for me, I would like to have the option to determine these things and have some oversight. Um, that's where you know some usability and ease of use may overtake options and the ability to be able to review these things. So MetaMask gives me that option. I can go into advanced, look at the network and change it myself. Uh, for the sake of the video, we'll leave it on average and we'll send the transaction. So we can see the gas fee, which is the transaction fee, is just what the term that uh, the Ethereum platform gives it. And we go ahead and do that. And we should be able to see that transaction return back into Exodus. And that's it. So in the same way, the second time we didn't check the address uh, for the purpose of the video to just be a bit quicker. Though these are the kind of process uh, that you go through in sending and receiving transactions. And with MetaMask, once you have the money in there, you can interact with various decentralized applications. And uh, if you want to interact with our platform, so the Bitopia Foundation, you can do so with MetaMask as well. So you can go ahead and download MetaMask in your browser, make sure your private key or the 12 words are kept safe. And after that, uh, you can participate within our organization, see our votes, um, participate in voting, decisions being made, etc. And uh, that's about it. It's pretty straightforward. So now I've shown you two examples. One is an actual standalone desktop wallet. The other one is MetaMask, which allows you to interact with dApps. And uh, you can see various decentralized applications. And uh, this is one of the websites. There are other websites as well. So if you're curious what kind of applications you can interact with, what's out there, it's very similar to the Play Store or uh, iTunes. And uh, you can learn more about what people are doing. It's quite exciting. A lot of people don't know about this and how, uh, how many apps actually exist. But there you have it. I will leave it there for this session. I am excited to say that in October, uh, I have been invited to speak at Paralini Police uh, Hackers Congress. It will be my sixth year. So if you're around, do check him out and uh, do come along. Uh, out of all the events I've ever been to, nothing comes close to this in being able to represent uh, 
cryptocurrencies and the ideologies that are behind them, uh, whether you're interested in privacy, security, uh, you know, a whole bunch of stuff out there. You can read the description of the event there. So it's October 2 uh, to 4th, 2020. And you can see the speakers and they will be adding a lot more speakers. You can purchase your ticket. They are a great, great organization. As I said, in the entire world, I have never seen anything come close to this in terms of integrity and in terms of being able to educate people on fundamentals of cryptocurrency or crypto anarchy or privacy, security, etc. And you're looking to learn whether you're a beginner or advanced user, it doesn't matter. You can get a lot out of this event. Cool. Thank you for watching our episodes. And uh, as mentioned, this is our final episode of season one. After this, uh, we'll be uh, initiating a marketing phase to inform people of Bitopia University and uh, building our interface and being able to uh, start classes thereafter. Cheers. Take care and uh, hope you enjoy this video and catch you soon on season two.